Judges chapter 6. Gideon is our guy today. And I want to extend uh, a welcome to all of our visitors uh, online and in person. If it's your first time and you're part of, we call, we call our online family our E-Tribe, okay? You're a whole tribe. We love you and we want you to join with us again. If you'd like to know more about membership, just let uh, them know online and they'll respond to you. And if you need to be born again, they can also respond to you about how we can connect with you for that. But today we want to teach a little bit, teach a little bit. So I hope you put your thinking caps on. If you've come for a shake, a rattle, and a roll, today might not be the day for that. But today we're definitely going to teach a little bit, and I need your attention. I should really, you know what I should do? I should sit down. Sitting down, you'd be surprised at how the posture changes everybody's expectation. Just sitting like this, and everybody's like, oh, right, we're going to teach today. But um, I haven't sat down for a while. I wonder if the camera has probably freaked out the camera people. They're like, stand up, pastor. You're not central, you know. But um, I think we want to teach today. Judges chapter 6. You know I'm going to stand up in a minute, all right? You know, I'm not going to sit down for long. Judges chapter 6. Let me do a little research. How many of you grew up in old school church? I mean, let's go back. Old school. Oh, Lord. Old school. <laughs> old school. Old school now. Now old school might be probably a wrong phrase. And I'm, I'll accept correction if necessary. But if you were in church as a child growing up, wave your hand at me. Okay, that's a, that's a good bunch of you. So, so wave your hand at me if you used to bring your Bible to church. Wave it high. Come on, I want to see because I want to see if the same hands. Wave it again if you still bring your Bible to church. Yeah, boy, that's gone down, fam. That's gone way down, fam. I don't know what's happened. These 2024 20, Christians. I ain't talking about your app. <laughs> yeah. The Bible says in Judges chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, The angel of the Lord came out and sat down under the oak in Ophrah. Not Oprah. <laughs> I saw some of you looking like, oh my gosh, no. In Ophrah. And just to extract the part that I want, where Gideon, that's our guy today, Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Good God. Just before we go any further, this angel of the Lord bit, it's worth us mentioning something here. And the part I want to mention here is angel of the Lord. Uh, some of you think when you see angel, it's a sent individual from heaven. Okay, and sometimes it is. But oftentimes this phrase angel of the Lord refers to what we in theology call, write it down, a theophany. A theophany in theology is a big word that simply means a temporary, it's the Old Testament, so Jesus hasn't, God hasn't manifested in the flesh yet as Jesus. Uh, so we call it a theophany, which is a temporary, just a temporary, visible manifestation of God himself. So it's his, his own angelic form, okay? So that's what we call a theophany. Uh, if you want to get deeper, those of you who are super erudite and perspicacious in theology, those of you who know about Christology, you'll know that it's also known by some as a pre-incarnate manifestation of Christ. But most of you don't care about that, so that's cool. <clears throat> Jud Judges chapter 6, verse 1 to 16, it says, uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. So this is a, a major deal here, major deal. He said, the Lord is with you mighty warrior. Okay, this is interesting. I, I like Gideon's response and, and the way the Bible puts it makes it sound like um, a thespian production. He says, pardon me, my Lord. <laughs> Gideon replied, but if, imperative, the Lord is with us, why are we going through all this drama? Why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our 
ancestors, as God's Old Testament people, our ancestors used to tell us about how he parted the Red Sea, how he rained manna down from heaven when they were in the wilderness. He did all this miraculous stuff, but where are all his wonders now? Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand to our enemies, the Midianites of Midian. The Lord turned to him. Notice not just the angel of the Lord now. It's letting us know it's actually a theophany, the visible manifestation of God himself. The Lord turned to him and said, go. I love the fact that God, God don't spend time arguing with us when we're starting arguments with him. The Lord said to him, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? It's me sending you, fam. If I'm sending you, fam, then you should just go. You've got it. I'm only calling people who've got it. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I, I, me, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in the tribe of Manasseh. And me, <laughs> as my parents used to say, me, which means it's a shocking way of saying how you're speaking about me. I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you. Those should be some of the most comforting words that anybody hears from God. Can I find 200, maybe 500 of you, balcony and main house? I don't need everybody. Just give me a group. Who, who loves to hear that God is in prison, God is with. In, in, in the middle of a divorce, God is with. In, in feeling depressed, God is with you. I love it. I love it. So today, I want to extend, because we're in a series at the moment, especially in this spring season. Uh, I want to extend from last week. And uh, this is going to bless me. If anybody remembers what we preached last week. What was the title last week? Uh-huh. I'm going home now, fam. That's it. I'm gone. Everybody, everybody quickly scroll to their notes app. <laughs> you all can depress past the boy. Lord Jesus. The other you. Push your neighbor and say, the other you. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, yeah, I knew it all along, you know. I just... I just <laughs> the other you I want to extend that this week and uh, we're going to be spending a little bit more time on it as part of our series during April uh, and I want to teach a little bit I got to teach last week and I enjoyed that amb ambiance and atmosphere and uh, did, was anybody blessed last week? Yeah. you don't even remember what it was how are you going about, about, you, about you're blessed? yes I was blessed don't know what you preach but I was blessed Oh, God, encourage me, Jesus. <laughs> so, Judges chapter 6 is uh, interesting. I've preached on it many a time, and as God dragged me back there again, I couldn't get away from it. I was telling Pastor Don over the weekend that I just feel this Gideon vibe, man. I just feel like God is, won't let me go anywhere other than to our guy Gideon again today. And, I, and I'm always conscious of trying to bring fresh stuff fresh scriptures that you may not have seen, but sometimes God drags you back to stuff you've preached on before, but wants us to um, extract some maybe fresh thinking from it. And so uh, we're going to keep talking about the other you. Those of you who were around last week and who remember, you'll know that we mentioned that actually it's the other, you remember the twins? You remember the twins? Okay, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> The, the other you is who God really is working on. It's the other you that God's working on. That's who he came back for with Thomas. He came back for, the, for the, his twin. <laughs> the other him. And because of that, I think we need to spend a little more time in this spring season as spring speaks of coming forth, uh, flourishing, becoming your best you, which is the God-ordained you. 
And so it's that vein that we want to remain in today. And so just look at your neighbor one more time. And just this is a little bit of funny saying, but look at your neighbor and say, hey, nice to meet me. Somebody write it on screen, E-Triber. E-Triber write, nice to meet me. Finally, I get to meet me. Look at the other side of you and say, finally, I get to meet me. Come on, tell them. <laughs> finally, I get to meet me. Yeah. Tomorrow is World Art Day. And it's interesting because... Um, It's going to be a big celebration in the artistic hotspots of the world as uh, artists and those who love art celebrate the contribution that art's made to sociology, the healing that art has brought in terms of therapy. Because there is a cathartic aspect when you take part in artistry and also being the recipient of something produced by an artist. I know within a certain generation, when you hear the word art or artist, you immediately think music. And of course, music is significant in terms of the fact that it is an art form. But when we go back to the classics and the more traditional association as it relates to art, we can't help but think about things like paintings and uh, something that I talk about regularly and we'll spend a little bit more time here today sculptures we're, we're used to the names of um, a Da Vinci we're used to the names of Van Gogh but many people might not have heard of people like uh, Alberto Giacometti who actually got to sell the world's most expensive sculpture at over $141 million. Something that started as just a lump of material. That he took his time and energy and tools to begin to take this lump of what looked like nothingness and spend time and energy, patience, dealing with something that a painter would not have to deal with. See, because as I've told you before, and forgive me for sounding repetitive, it's not complacency, it's just me trying to explain again the fact that when it comes to painters versus sculptors, there's a big difference because a painter is involved, if we look at it mathematically, in addition a painter's painting more strokes on a blank canvas. And so the job, arguably, is easier. He's not dealing like a sculptor with the principle of subtraction. A sculptor is involved in subtraction and not simply subtraction, but dealing not with a blank canvas, but with a resistant material. <laughs> A piece of material that does not want to be chipped away at. Huh. And that is why I believe God, as the ultimate artist, is more of a sculptor, at least when he first finds you, than he is a painter. Because he spends most of his time Only some Vaseline after this or something. But, <laughs> but he's going to spend most of his time removing stuff off of you before he can become what you really want him to be. And I really want him to be, which is a painter. I want him to add stuff to my life. Bless me. Our prayers are praying more to the God who is a painter than the prayers are to the God who is a sculptor. We want him to paint a lump. 
and don't realize that actually will just look like something colorful but useless. Okay. I don't know if you can handle it. Uh, if, if I can keep going, if I'm helping anybody, shout preach, pastor. Come on. It, it's, 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 it's something with us that we don't want to go through the difficulty. And can you imagine the frustration of the artist, sculptor, our God, as he tries to get us to understand if you'll stand still and stop resisting the sooner I can get you into the shape that I know is really there. This lump is not the real you. I'm trying to reveal the other you. And the other you is underneath all of this stuff that I want to remove off of your life. And once I get you to a certain stage, then I can start adding. Oh, I wish, I wish somebody would understand this. I can add stuff to your life that will make you more glorious, that will embellish you, that will make you more beautiful than you ever expected your life could be, but you won't stand still. <laughs> you won't stand still. You won't stand still. You keep resisting me by hanging with people you shouldn't be hanging with. You keep resisting me by, 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 by not showing up when I need you to show up to hear the word. that will Because that, my, my word becomes a tool that helps chisel away at the stuff that's on you. That's why we preach in series. Why do you think most of the time we preach in series? Because we know the thing that needed to be removed isn't removed the first time you hear it. You understand what I'm trying to say? So we keep hitting and hitting and hitting. And sometimes you're like, you know, no, no, no. Let me find somewhere that I'm going to go and hear about addition. I'll go to an addition conference. Rather than a subtraction. I, I wish somebody would understand me here. But God mathematically deals with subtraction when it comes to our lives. Before he deals with somebody shout addition. Because God is a sculptor. And if God is a sculptor, then it's interesting. We need to then get to the maturity level where we recognize that all things, even the things that seem to hurt sometimes, have to work together, according to Romans 8 and 28, for our good. It's revealing the real, the ultimate, the predestined you. And this is what I kind of find inside of the story that we read just a moment ago. This story to do with Gideon. Because actually... We meet Gideon, but before we meet Gideon, if you check out the actual context of our text by going back to the very beginning of the chapter in your own time, and everybody should do this, Sunday should not be a time where you just come and hear what's preached and roll out. You should also go and read and listen again afterwards and let the word get digested into your spirit to where God really wants it to go to. Sometimes we're eating too fast and you get indigestion and you end up bringing up what God wanted to go down. And so you need to take your time to go over it again but it's interesting when you study the context of what we've just read because actually we're presented with a season in the history of God's Old Testament people where they had fallen into big word get ready a word called apostasy they'd fallen into apostasy apostasy simply is a big word we use to say they've fallen back from where they should be in their relationship with God They'd fallen back. Here's the reason they fell back with their relationship with God. Because they wanted to be so much like the other nations. They wanted a God that they could see. See, the other nations, the other nations around God's people, all these other nations, they had what we know as now idols that they made themselves. How dumb must you be to worship something you made? That's not God. <laughs> But, but they, they had these, 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 these poles, these Ashtara poles. They had, they had all kinds of things that had been created by them. As, and as they called these things their gods. And Israel were, were, would be seen sometimes worshipping what seemed to be nothing because nobody could see their God, though you could see the effect of their God. And so they wanted to be like the other nations. So they, they did stuff that made them fall into apostasy by creating gods so they could be like everybody else. Let me tell you one of the most dangerous things you can do is start changing your life because you want to be like everybody else. <laughs> so, so, so they started making these idol gods. They started worshiping false gods. They started drifting back from the relationship with God, falling into apostasy. Old school church would say they backslid. They put the words the other way around, which means they slid back from the relationship with God. And here's the problem. 
God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But he never said you'd never leave him. And if we're not careful, it's not long before like somebody laying on an inflatable at a beach, they begin to drift and drift and drift. And then you wake up coming from your slumber and realize you've drifted so far from the shoreline of what you believed about God. That not even sometimes those responsible can get to you quick enough to rescue you. They drifted from under God. And when you drift from under the covering of God, when you drift from under the covering of God, you become exposed. Oh, God. You become exposed. Exposed to things that wanted to get to you all along. Okay, exposed to things that God had you shielded from. Some, somebody in here knows your Bible. You, 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 remember, you remember Job? You remember Job? You remember Job in the Bible? Job, 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 Job in the Old Testament. You remember how the devil, the loose Lucifer, he came to God and he said, listen, listen, I want to get to Job, but you've put a hedge around him. And some of you don't realize that there's a hedge around. I know you're going through difficulty right now. I know you're going through trouble right now. But guess what? It would be far worse if there was not a hedge. Where's my church? Where's my church? I need 200 people to know it was the hedge that protected you. I know things might feel difficult right now, but imagine if there was no hedge. A hedge becomes a demarker, a demarcation that says to the enemy, you are trespassing if you cross this line. If you cross this line, we have the right to evict you in the name of Jesus. But they drifted, they drifted. God's Old Testament people, they drifted. His Old Testament people had drifted, drifted because they wanted to be so much like everybody else. I want to, we, we want a God like everybody else. God, this is so embarrassing. Every time we worship you, it looks like we're worshiping nothing. It looks like it's just invisible air we're worshiping. We want to be like everybody. Can we just, just set up a totem pole, some kind of an Ashtara pole, some kind of an idol that we can worship? And if you check out the scripture and we'll look at it in the coming weeks, you'll see that they set up so many idols. Because they wanted to be like everybody else. Idols, idols. Oh God, I can't wait to get into that series, that part of the series. They wanted to be like everybody else rather than walk in the lane that God had called them to walk in. You don't need to worry about who can't see your God. They'll be able to see the effects of your God in your life. That's why you've got to understand that our lives become the first Bible anybody gets to read. It becomes the first piece of evidence that God exists. That's why you should not keep your testimony to yourself. When you get your promotion, when you get your breakthroughs, you ought to tell somebody who doesn't even know God that it's because of my God. But some of you keep your God undercover. I know, I know. You you check God in the dark. You treat God like a booty call. You just call him when you really need him, but it's always in the dark. And nobody even knows that you have faith in Jesus. Some of you are like that, yeah, Uh uh-huh. Secret, secret society, Jesus. Secret relationship, Jesus. But God wants others to know through your life because here's what happens, really, really. Israel, God's Old Testament people, the Israelites, the Hebrews, they were supposed to be his masterpiece, his showpiece to the rest of the world of of how relationship with the true God can be a blessing in your life. That was his, he was supposed to, he was trying to sculpt them. But every time he wanted to sculpt them, they kept moving away from him to want to be like everybody else. If I'm helping anybody in here, somebody shout back amen. If I, it's, it's interesting here because seven years then, they drift, they drift, they've drifted. And for seven years, God's like, well, if you're, if you're leaving me, then you don't need me. Let's see what those idols can do for you. See if those idols can protect you. See, sometimes we we turn, oh God, I'm running ahead of myself. We turn money into an idol. We turn jobs and careers into an idol. And when it comes down to it, after a while, you get to realize those things really can't protect you from everything. He drifted. And their enemies, the Midianites, somebody shout it with me, say Midianites. The Midianites seized the opportunity to come and oppress God's people. Oh, they've come from under God now. Now they're exposed. Let's go after them. And the Midianites are an interesting group. Because the Midianites, historically, with God's Old Testament people, 
Historically with the Hebrews, the Midianites actually had some kind of close connection initially. It's fascinating how, how people who had close connection with you, it don't take long if you're not careful before they become your arch enemies. What do you mean? What do you mean Old Testament people? Pastor explained, even Moses, you remember Mo Moses married a Midianite girl. Zipporah, she was from Midian. She was a PK, a pastor's daughter from Midian. Her dad was the pastor, the priest in Midian. It's fascinating. They've got close connection, but now, now over time, there's been a drift and they don't like to see the blessing of God that's on God's people. So the moment God's people drift, they're like, now let's attack them. And for seven years, good Jesus, for seven years, seven years, they came under the oppression of the Midianites. The Midianites would do stuff like this. Check it out in your own time. I'm just giving you the remix version. The Midianites would rock up to the crops of God's people. The people were relying on these crops to feed their families and feed the nation. And the Midianites would rock up to the, to the crops and, and just bully all of the farmers off of the crops and watch this and just set a light to the crops. Burn them. Because the enemy there didn't really care about having what you have. They just don't want you to have it. Okay, that resonated with somebody. Sometimes your haters, it's not that they want what you've got. They just don't want you to have it. That's why they snoop on your stories. They snoop on your Instagram. They snoop on your Facebook to try and find something to burn down the reputation of and to try and gossip about. They don't want your breakthrough. They just don't want you to have a breakthrough. They'd rather see you with a breakdown. It costs to be blessed. Please understand, the moment you're asking God for blessing, you are asking God for more enemies. You're asking God for more haters. You're asking, come on now, somebody. you got to understand that. This, this Midianite group, they rock up and they just be destructive just to be venomous, vindictive, and violent to God's people. And because God's people had come from under his covering. See, see, see this is the difference between me and you, maybe. I don't want the blessing without the covering see some of you are asking God for the blessing but you don't care about him you don't care about his hands I want what's in his hands with his hands oh come on now somebody I want one hand to give me but the other hand to cover me so that all the haters and the enemies that want to gossip want to try and pull me down want to try and destroy and want to try and attack they can't get to me because not only am I blessed but I'm covered that's what winds some people up about you because you're blessed and covered. You're, come on now, somebody. I wish somebody would understand this. That's what I want from God, not just the blessing. Don't just give me the house. Give me the anointing over it. Don't just give me the car. Give me the covering over it. Don't just give me the marriage. Give me your blessing over it. Slap your neighbor high five and say, blessed and covered. Some of you all just want the blessing that God were ever in it. Just bless me. Nah, fam. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say in the Greek. Look at them and say, nah, fam. <laughs> I want the blessing. I want the blessing and the covering. Too many people get the blessing and then you forget to pray. You ain't got time to worship anymore. You can't bother with praising. You rock up to church late. You don't care what's going on. But I want the blessing and the covering. Tell you the truth, I'd rather the covering. See, see, I've lost, I've lost like 50% of the church. They're like, nah, fam, give me the blessing. Let me tell you something, blessing ain't helping you when the devil starts attacking your life. Blessing ain't helping you when the enemy starts plotting against you. Blessing ain't helping you when disease starts getting diagnosed. You need the covering. Somebody scream, cover me. That's what I want. Cover my business, God. Cover my investment. Cover my finances. Cover my health. Cover my children. Cover my marriage. Cover my family. Cover me, God. Don't just bless me. But cover me. 
I need you to look at two people around you like you're their insurance broker and say, are you covered? I know you got the blessing, but are you covered? Are you covered? I'm telling you, I'm in the peopleology business. And I, I deal with, I've been dealing with people for 26 years. And I found out that there's some people who've got big blessing. Blessing, money. They've got all of that. They've got all of it. And I love it. I'll sing it too. Blessing, money. But they need one more verse on that. So cover him. Cover me. Don't let the get the enemy. One more verse. Give me one more verse. I love the song. But I need the covering. Slap your neighbor high five. Say, cover me now, God. So. <laughs> So just like you and me, they begin to cry out to God. They're like, oh God. Because <laughs> you know how we are. We're ter- we're just, we'll drift and then start making. You know, he- here's the fascinating thing. Actually, before I get to that, I, I didn't want to teach it in this way, but, but seeing as you're letting me teach today, uh, it, uh, it's interesting to me, to me, maybe not you, maybe it's just a nerd in me, but it's fascinating to me. How actually some of what Gideon says, and I didn't want to get to Gideon just yet, but seeing as we're there. Some of what Gideon says is reflective of the attitude of the nation. I feel a Kung Fu anointing. I chop up the devil today. It's reflective of the attitude of the nation. What do you mean, pastor? Notice what he kept saying. He said, look, 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 what, where, where's, where's the blessing? Why are we going through this? <laughs> With that cadence in his voice. What, what, what happened to the God? My, my mom used to tell me about who, who can do miracles. Look what I'm going through. Look what he's letting me go through. No. Gideon, South London, okay. That's what he's saying. He said, where are, where are the wonders? He said, How, God's abandoned us. No, babe, no, bro. No, babe, no, bro, bro. No, babe, no, bro. This is the problem. Because pain looks for blame and takes aim. And who it takes aim at oftentimes is God. We blame God Oftentimes, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. E tribe, maybe I need to talk to you today. I don't know if the people are going to handle it in the house because the truth is sometimes we're blaming God for what we chose. What got you into that situation was your own choice to drift from under. You were the one who said you wanted to be like all the other nations. And now you've drifted and hell is being released on your life through the Midianites. Now you want to blame God? Here's why most of us are quiet. Because we know, oh God, that's me. Where's the church? How comes the church ain't helping? You chose to marry him. You listen to the fact that he talked like Jesus with a heart of Judas and jumped into a relationship out of your own choice. Can we get to the stage where we're mature enough to stop blaming God? For our own choices. Oh, God will rescue. God is a good God. Yes, he is. He picks me up, 
turns me around with my old school folk, plants my feet on solid ground. But God is a good God. Yes, he is. But the reason he needs to pick me up is because I chose to walk into danger. You disobeyed what the Holy Spirit was saying to your heart and ended up in hell. And then turn around and blame heaven. I'm not going to church. I can't can't believe God's letting me go through this. I'm done with church. I've seen it all. (laughs) And this is the attitude of God's people even in the Old Testament. Gideon's words are... Wave your hand at me if you're catching this. Gideon is, Gideon is, his, his, his statements, his words are reflective of the attitude of the nation. Now, now, this is what I love about our God though. God is merciful. You can keep Allah, you can keep Buddha, you can keep Confucius, give me Jesus. Because his mercies endure forever. Push your neighbor and say, that means there's always hope for you to be rescued. Come on. Mm. I love the fact that my God can rescue me from my own foolishness. So long as I admit it was my own foolishness. <laughs> oh, I've got to hurry up. Okay. Um, so, so, uh, uh, uh. You know, it's funny, there's no other place I'd rather preach than home, you know, home. The the problem is you preach too long when you're at home. Because you enjoy yourself too much, you know. I feel like I'm at Orton Towers right now, you know what I'm trying to say? (laughs) When I get, as a guest speaker, you know, you're limited and you're like, I don't know these people, they don't know me, let me just bless them and go. But at home, you just want to be home, man. But you you all, the problem is you make me preach too long. Look at your neighbor and say, it's your fault. Watch this now. <laughs> so, so God, God, God does what he keeps doing. He does what he keeps doing. He raises up somebody. He's got his eye on somebody who's going to be a, what we call deliverer. Now here's the thing. Within, within God's Old Testament people, the Hebrews, the Israelites, what you find is you have a plethora of different styles of leadership. You've got from the moment they left Egypt under Moses, who was known as their deliverer, their prophet. He was their leader. He delivered them. Then after him, you have this group of people, in essence, that after him, you've got Joshua. And then, of course, you've got what we call the judges. The judges. Now, when you hear judge, you think of legal system, courts. No, it's just a word, really, that means deliverers. You've got characters who became leaders, leadership figures like Samson, like Deborah, and even right now who we're reading about, Gideon. God raises these individuals up during certain seasons when God's people keep drifting back, getting into trouble, and they need somebody. God raises up somebody to become a leader figure, to show them the way out, to fight against their enemies, to stir up momentum again. And God's got his eye on this guy called Gideon. Gideon's name's interesting. Gideon's name means chopper. Means cutter. He's a cutter. Something about him. He's a cutter. He's a chopper. He can cut stuff down. And that will be quite relevant as we go over the weeks. And I want you to write that down. Those of you who care to make notes and are serious about the word of God. These are interesting things that are worth knowing because they'll they'll be reflected uh, in our future teaching this month about some of this stuff. But it's interesting that Gideon, God has his eye on Gideon. He has his eye on Gideon. Now, here's, here's the points. Here's the key points. The key points here is the fact that God's raising up Gideon. And he says, he says, I'm going to go down. I'm going to, I'm going to, it's time. I'm going to select Gideon. I'm going to select Gideon. Notice the people, including Gideon, have been crying out, wow, seven years, it's oppression, it's a madness, this is crazy, and the Midianites are attacking us, we are God's people, why are we going through this? They've been crying out to God, while God has been working, as usual, on raising up the answer to their cries. It's interesting how Gideon doesn't realize that he is praying and crying out for himself. Okay. 
Okay. Gideon, you are going to be the answer. Me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. It's interesting because the, the, the angelic presence of the Lord sits down while Gideon is doing something crazy. And we're going to talk about what he was doing in a minute. But the, the angelic being of the Lord sits down on an oak, under an oak, an oak tree in Ophrah. And Gideon is there threshing wheat in a wine press. I'm going to come to that in a minute. But what I want you to notice something here is the angel of the Lord says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Mm. Mighty warrior. The Lord is with you in more than one way. In two ways. The Lord is with you because I'm, I'm here now with you. But the Lord is also with you in the fact that his hand is upon you. His anointing is with you. Mighty warrior. Jesus, I wish I had the time. Mighty warrior. He calls a farmer a fighter. Okay, but God, you must have made a mistake. What do you mean? No, he's a farmer. Look, he's even got wheat in his hands. His name means chopper. That, that's, that's something to do, with, to do with farming, agriculture, whether it's chopping trees, whether it's chopping, chopping wheat. He, 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 but you've got, no, you, you're talking to the wrong person. No, no, no. Mighty warrior. Look at your neighbor and say, the other you. Because God always speaks to the other you. That's why some of what God asks you to do doesn't make sense. He says, mighty warrior. Let's not forget something, church. Please, let's not forget something. That God often speaks to the you he really created. My, now, my Wednesday night live crowd, they'll catch this. Some of you won't catch it. But I need to show you it. Because understand this, that God deals with oftentimes you being made and dealt with and formed again. So the Bible uses words, and I hope I don't lose you here. The Bible uses words that some of us read and we read over or we hear if you've been in church long enough and we don't realize they have serious significance. The Bible talks about the fact that we are, we are redeemed. It's on the front row getting this. Jesus have mercy. Somebody shout redeemed. redeemed. From the back. I need to hear the back. Shout redeemed. 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 If you deem something, when I deem you something, I deem you, I name you, I label you. To be redeemed is to be relabeled. Okay, okay, okay. Restored. He, he, he'll, he restores my soul. Restore. That means there was storage before. Something went wrong. Now he has to restore it. In Genesis, let me take you deeper. Can I go deeper? In Genesis, the command he gave to mankind was to do what? Replenish the earth. Re, re. It was plenished before. Something happens. Now it needs to be replenished. And so God is often redoing things. Oh, Jesus, have mercy. That's why you need to be transformed by the renewing. Oh, somebody shout. This is an RE lesson. Come on, tell them. Renew. Re somebody shout, renew. And so understand this. That means there's something that happened before and God has to re it. Okay, okay, stay with me, stay with me. I'm laying a framework here because I want you to understand something. If you check out even, uh, uh, okay, let me give you my Wednesday Night Live crowd stuff. Understand this, remember that you, you, hey you, you were created before you were formed. Mankind was created and then formed. Put it on screen. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Look what it says. Everybody read it together. One, two, three, go. Before I formed you in the womb, I actually knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. He says to Jeremiah specifically, I appointed you as a prophet. He says, before you were even put together and constructed in the womb, there was a you. God. In other words, there was a you before you were born. Where's my church? There was a, come on girl, there was a you before you were born. 
Somebody shout, that you. Shout it out. Say, that you. Now lean on your neighbor and say, was your creation. But watch this. Watch this. Genesis 1, 27. 1, 27. Look at this. Genesis 127, put it on screen when you get a chance. Genesis 1 and 27 is interesting. So God, this is right at the beginning. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God created he them, male and female, he created them. God created. Somebody shout created. Created. Write it down, created. Created. Somebody shout creation. Okay, so still staying in Genesis. Now go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and verse, watch this, verse 7. Genesis 2 and verse 7 says, Then the Lord God formed... A man from the, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So you've got one verse talks about creation. This verse talks about formation. So you were created before you were formed. You are supposed to be here. I don't care if the transportation was the back of a car after a movie one night. Okay, okay, I've lost them. I've lost them. They're like, back of a car? What kind of movie? What are you talking about? Okay, I'll leave that. You work that out later. I don't care if it was behind a bike shed and not even in a bed. You were supposed to be here because God knew you before. Oh, where is my church? I wish I had a church who knew this. That's why every time the devil tells you to throw the towel in on your life, you ought to say, I'm supposed to be here. Your creation preceded your formation, according to scripture. So God does not really speak to your formation. When God's talking to you, he's talking to your creation. The you that was originally created by him in spirit form before you were formed physically in your mother's womb. Okay, 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 okay. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, he had a plan for you. Okay, okay. The spirit of God knew you as a spirit. He created you in his image and likeness. You were spirit being. And then somehow through your mother's womb, you got formed, born into the world. And then all of a sudden the formation started becoming deformed. As trauma, abuse, Bad girlfriends, boyfriends, debt. The world's fallen system starts reshaping your formation. And then before you know it, you've completely forgotten what God told you you were designed for in your creation. And so when you meet God, now in your formation, he has to, oh God, remind you He reminds you. He gives you a new mind and reminds you of what he called you back in your creation. Oh, I wish somebody would understand this here. So when he meets Gideon, who's been formed into a fearful farmer, he does not speak to the deformation. He speaks to the creation and says, mighty warrior. I wish I had some mighty warriors in this room who knew that the devil has tried to deform your life, but God is speaking to the... Science has still confused. Science is still confused to this day. Check it out yourselves. I know you do anyway. But science to this day 
is still confused. They can only present theories, not facts. On what? Deja vu. The sense that, hold on, I feel like I've, I've seen this before. I've been here before. There is no fact, no proof. It's only theory they used to argue it. Maybe. Just maybe. Deja vu is you having a glitch of a flashback to what God predestined in your creation. Oh God, where's ha? You're late, ready for this. He, he has to renew your mind. And when you come to church, some of you are like, why is pastor preaching about victory and I'm a this and a... Because God is trying to remind you. The devil's job is to make you believe all of the formation and deformation is the real you. But God is only going to be speaking to the other you. The original you. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to praise him like an original. I'm not going to praise him like I'm going through all this deform. Come on, deform. I'm going to praise him like I'm the head and not the tail. Because that's what he told me in my creation. I'm going to praise him like I'm, I'm, be- I'm above and not beneath. Okay, okay, okay. So he meets Gideon. Gideon, Gideon thinks he's a farmer. He's a fearful farmer, traumatized by the Midianite oppression. God comes down, doesn't even say, Oh, I know, fam, it's sudden, it's a madness. God just speaks to the other you. He doesn't shout to the other you. He speaks to the other you. Because God is confident about what's already on the inside of you. All you need to let him do is remove the deformation to reveal the creation. Too many people take their lives because they believe the lie of the enemy telling them your formation, your deformation, your trauma, your abuse, your difficulties, your drama that you've been through is you. That's not the real you. The very word we use in church for people who are not saved, we say they're lost. You can only be lost if you, if you belong to something or someone, first of all. So what you are, you're lost in need of being reminded. Oh God. Of what God called you to be. That's why when you come into church, we preach to the real you. Stop telling yourself you're nasty and you're no good and you don't know. And, and then the world causes us to affirm the deformation i'm I'm just i'm I'm just crazy i'm just no no don't keep saying that because you water your life with your words something uh, a big church like this 25 people clapped (laughs) proverb 18 4 write it down proverb i'm going to put it on screen i'm just going to say it for the people who are checking me out online saying he can't preach Proverb 18, 4, Isaiah 55, 10 to 11 teaches us that your words are water. You water your life with your words. And the problem is some of us are pouring toxic water on something that's already hurt. Your life, your life will grow the seeds of whatever you water. So if as part of your deformation, the enemy has planted weeds, if you keep watering those weeds, they'll grow. They won't become wheat. Stay with me. Mighty warrior. Oh, 
God is saying to somebody today, he's looking you in your face and saying, I know what you've been through. I know your dad didn't treat you right. I know you were abused. I know you were mistreated. I know all of that. But I'm speaking to the mighty warrior on the inside. I'm speaking to the businesswoman. I'm speaking to the businessman. I'm speaking to the ministry individual. I'm speaking to the leader, the person that I ordained in your creation. That's why you must be born again. Oh, some of you missed that. I must be born again. Because when I'm born again, it gives me a chance to now undo all of that deformation to go back to the plan of his creation. Stay with me. Stay with me. Watch this now. So, Three things, and that's it. I'll give the rest of the second service. <laughs> Three things. <laughs> Three things I want you to notice happen. They are God's PowerPoint. They are God's picture. It's a picture, it's a PowerPoint. They are not included in the text just to fill up the pages. If God's included them in the text then there's a reason he's put them there. And I think, I think if you'd allow me a little conjecture, a little room to maneuver, that they are speaking to us of some stages in our development we must accept if we're going to start living according to our creation and not our formation. If we're going to see the mighty warrior in us, that warrior may be a warrior of a businessman, a businesswoman, a ministry that you may start, a charity, I don't know what it is God has created you to do. But number one, notice, God came. Am I boring you? You're still here? God came and sat down. He sat down, the Bible says, he sat down under an oak. We're going to get to that. He sat down while Gideon was threshing wheat and it was happening in a wine press. Wheat, wine press, tree. Wheat, wine press, tree. Wheat, let's do the wheat first. The wheat, the wheat's interesting because he was threshing wheat. Now, us in our 21st century, we go Asda and buy bread. We don't know the stuff that it takes for the wheat to become the bread. But it starts off in those ancient times with what we call threshing. It's when they take the grain, they take the wheat grain, they'd hit it on the ground so that the wheat would fall off onto the floor then they take what is called a winnowing fork stay with me and they toss the wheat in the air throw it in the air with the fork throw it in the air with the fork and they do this to make sure that the outer casing called the husk or in the bible language called the chaff would be separated from what they could use which is the wheat the outer skin of the wheat grain is called chaff and that is a lightweight, useless thing for human beings. But the wheat is the part you want. And because it's heavier, it falls to the ground. And that's what you want to keep. So stay with me. So they toss it in the air using a winnowing fork. Winnowing fork. I've got it on screen here. It's an old piece of footage that shows you some of the traditions they'd use. But I want you to understand, they do this. Watch this now. Stay with me. Stay with me now. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. They do this to allow the wind to help them. It's the wind that was a critical part of the threshing process. Okay, the wind, the wind, the wind. What, what do you mean the wind, pastor? They do this stuff, watch this now. He's threshing wheat. Gideon, you can take it off screen. I want their attention. They're threshing wheat in a wine press. That don't make no sense. Why are you threshing wheat where you're supposed to produce wine? Because of fear. It was for fear of the Midianites taking the little wheat they were able to save. Fear is an intoxicant that will make you panic and screw up your perspective and make you start doing the right thing in the wrong places. Loving the right way at the wrong person. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so, 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 watch this. They throw it up in the air. Now, watch this. It's interesting because 
in topography. Sorry to be a nerd, but I needed to understand in topography, in the way geography and landscapes work, the wine press was usually in a low place. Whereas you'd thresh wheat up on top of a hill or a mountain so you could catch the wind. So as the fork dug into the wheat and tossed it in the air, the wind, nothing would block the wind coming and blowing the chaff away and the grain, because it's heavier, would fall to the ground. Then you'd scoop up the grain because that's what you want. Watch this here. The wind represents two things for us today. The wind represents, number one, the spirit of God. Until you get to the place where you expose your life to the spirit of God for him to show you what's right, what's useful, and what's not useful. You won't see the real you manifested. The wheat, the threshing speaks of what Gideon is going to go through. God is going to take Gideon on this journey of getting rid of what's not necessary, what's not useful, the chaff of his life, so that God can reveal the wheat of his life. It's also representative of something even deeper. Stay with me, don't miss this. Because if you don't listen and obey God's word, remember the threshing, the threshing, the threshing, the threshing was about separation. Separating what's useful from what's not useful. Discerning what's good from what's not good. If you don't get to that stage where you mature to being able to separate what's for you and what's not for you, what's good to you in looks could be bad for you in action. If you don't get to the stage of discernment, then you don't get to see the real you. And here's the thing. The wind here is harsh. Because if you don't listen to God's word, because God's word, God's word already tells you what's for you and what's not for you. God's word already teaches you what's right and what's wrong. God's word already teaches you what's chaff and what's wheat. But if you don't listen to God's word, he has to allow a wind. A situation that blows into your life. That makes you realize, oh, no, 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 no. I don't need that. God would rather us listen to his word and do what's right than have to experience a wind. But some people are so stubborn. My mother would say back when we were kids, if we did something wrong and we were, because she was like a little smurfette, she couldn't affect us properly after a while because we're all bigger than her. And she's trying to slap us. We're going, okay, mom, when you finish. She said, wait till your father gets home. Because if you don't hear. And when the wind of dad came into the room. <laughs> what's worth writing down here is obey the word. Don't wait for the wind. If you know every time you come to church and pastor or one of the team is preaching or we got a guest here and there's something in that word that speaks to an area of your life obey the word do not wait for the wind why wait for a storm a hurricane a tornado or something crazy to blow into your life to have to wake you up to realize that that person is chaff that situation is chaff. It's not wheat. It's not beneficial to you. Let it go. If the word teaches you that, then listen to the word. Do not wait for the wind. Because when the wind blows, other stuff goes. So if you don't learn about discernment, what's chaff? Somebody shout chaff. Somebody else shout wheat. If you don't learn the difference, how to discern the difference, this is for me, this is not for me, then you don't get to see the real you. The mighty warrior is there, but it will be locked up until you get to the maturity stage, I believe, where you learn to discern. Number two, he's threshing wheat in a wine press. 
A wine press, a wine press. Now, now the wine press is, of course, the place where you'd pour grapes. Oh, I wish you'd hear me here today. It's where you pour grapes. And what that speaks to us of, the fact that what's valuable about you is on the inside of you. The problem is some of us, oh, <laughs> some of us would rather be raisins than wine. Raisins, look on screen. Do you know the amount of people who don't know that raisins are grapes? Raisins are grapes that are the cheaper end of productivity of what could have come from that fruit. In fact, even in French, I know we've got French members here, even in French, the very word fr in, in French for grape is raisin. And, and, and raisins, raisins versus grapes. Can you imagine, can you imagine if you are a grape and you had the choice, do you, do you resist the press? Resist the press, the wine press, the wine press, the wine press, where what's valuable inside of you, for it to come out, you're going to have to go through a season of pressure. Do you choose the pressure so that you can produce what's valuable because a bottle of, a, a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon, a bottle of Malbec, a bottle is far more expensive. A bottle than a bag of raisins. But it's your choice as to whether I'll stay out, I just want to be out in the sun, I don't, I don't want to have to go through no pressure and dry up, shrivel up so that all you end up being is a raisin. You taste sweet, but you feel nothing. And that's based on whether you choose to allow yourself to go through a season of pressure. Pressure. The pressure of not being able to do what all your other friends are doing. That used to drive me nuts. I'm going to tell you the truth. Could I testify real quick? I know you'd say yes to that. <laughs> a big man business. It used to drive me nuts growing up that my friends could get away with stuff I couldn't get away with. They were out there wilding. I'm talking about friends in church. Some of them were wilding. And I'd go and try and wild out with them. And they, I was the one to get caught. <laughs> my, my brother's clapping over there, he knows. I was the one, my mum would find out about me, I'd be in trouble. I, there's, there's, there's Bishop's son, look at Bishop's son up against the wall with that girl, look at Bishop's son in the dance. Look at Bishop, look at, look at, I was like, why, why me? They're doing it as well. Was that too much information for you? I don't know. If I crossed the line there, I'm not sure. It's too late, it's, it's YouTube. Look, 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 that, that's him running, running with that, that drug dealer. Look at him over there. Look, look, that's that pastor. Look at him. Look at him. Look, look. Ring in my house. Bishop, Bishop, I saw your son. Did you? Get lost, you nosy cow. Go on. <laughs> that's, that's what was in my spirit, okay? That's what was in my spirit, okay? But you know why? You know why? I, it's, only when you, it's only retrospectively you understand because God was dealing with the other you. But I had to go through extra pressure because God knew that I was going to influence thousands. I, I, I wish somebody would understand this here. And, and when you don't know your future, you act like your past. God knew, though, there was another you. So I had to go through the pressure where I couldn't do everything everybody else did. Yeah, I want to go out with the gang as well and, and beat man up and kidnap people. 
It looked exciting. I was, the, I was a different kind of SOB. I was a son of a bishop. <laughs> and is, was that too much information? I'm not sure. I should have saved this for second service because it doesn't stream. Okay? I know we're streaming at the moment. I would go and just, you know, rough it. And I would be the one that got caught. Cool. Because God knew there's a, another you. Will you allow yourself to go through the pressure of not being able to do everything everybody does? You can't have all the boyfriends everybody does. You can't have all, you can't just sleep around like everybody does. You can't just take the money like everybody does. You can't just do, you, 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 you've, you've got to go through the pressure of resisting trying to be like everybody else. As I said at the top end, that's what got God's people in trouble in the first place. They were trying to be like everyone else. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, done. So, raisin or grape? wine it's not just it's not just the wine vat it was the wine press pressure pressure it's pressure I, 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 want, I want to get involved in that as well but no 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 you can't do that because there, there's another you that God's talking to finally finally notice where the, the 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 angel of the Lord sat the angel of the Lord sat under an oak tree you think this is just stuff in the Bible. No, there's lessons in all the pictures. He's sitting under the oak tree. He's sitting under something that's magnificent and creating shade for others, but started as a seed. This little acorn, this little acorn turned eventually into a massive oak tree that's able to cover people, protect, create shade. He's speaking to Gideon's warrior and saying, Gideon, I know you're saying you're the least of your clan, but so was the acorn. But there's going to be a season when you're going to have to be buried you're going to be hidden and that's what's been happening to you. You've been hidden. God hid you for your future, not from your future. And now it's time for the real you to rise up. That's why I'm not speaking to just Gideon. I didn't even call you by your name. I called you a mighty warrior. Could it be? That these previous years have been the season where you've been buried. But God now, you're in the Tab Church London. You're watching us online. E-Tribe. And God is speaking to the other you. Saying it's time now for the other you to rise up. You've been buried like an acorn, believing that you're nothing. You're the least of your family. You've never owned a house. You've never run a business. You've never been in that position in a job. You've never done this, never done that, never done the other. That was the acorn you. But now God speaks to you and says it's time to rise. You can't keep making excuses and talking like Gideon. You've got to talk like the mighty warrior. I'm done. I think, I think today, God is calling us as we open up. And this was just laying foundation. This is the shallow end of the pool. We're going to get deeper over the next couple of weeks. But I want somebody to understand that your frustrations oftentimes are because you're trying to still be Gideon. When God is talking to the warrior. He's talking to the other you. And finally today. I get to meet me. The me that was from my creation. Not the me that was corrupted through my formation. People who want to remain the old them, this kind of church will frustrate you. 
This kind of church will get on your nerves. You'd rather a religious environment where you just go according to a particular liturgy, sing a couple of hymns, and the vicar stands up there, says his thing, and then everybody rolls out. Rather than an atmosphere that speaks to the mighty warrior. I'm finished for today. It's sad. It's so sad. Not that I'm finished. He's probably happy about that. But, but it's sad that, that Gideon was so blind. He's blind. Stay with me. Stay with me. Don't miss this part. This is it. I will show you how blind he is. I want to show you how addicted to your past you can be that you're blind to your future. Can I show you? You remember in the Civil, Civil War in America? In the Civil War in America, it's crazy. Because you had slaves on the Confederate side fighting against those who are trying to fight, in essence, for their freedom. Because they had conditioned their mind so used to being told what to do that if they were given a gun and said, shoot that guy in the uniform, the blue uniform, the red uniform, the whatever uniform, they just shoot him without even question because they were so conditioned. We can be so conditioned to our Gideon that we're blind to our mighty warrior. And we start shooting at people who are trying to set us free. Gideon said this. He said this. Listen to how dim he is. <laughs> how blind he is. Gideon looks at the angelic being of the Lord. And says this, stay with me. Where are the wonders? <laughs> Fam. You are looking at a theophany. A visible temporary manifestation of God. That's come to visit you. And you're going, pardon me, Lord, but where are the wonders? You're so blind that you don't realize you are looking at a wonder. That's how conditioned our minds can be. That's why our minds need to be renewed. Where are the wonders? I could have called this message. Where are the wonders? Gideon, are you so bound and abused and mistreated and messed up in your mind that you can't see the wonder is right in front of you? Imagine if you're so bound by your old relationship that you can't see the husband in front of you. So traumatized by what you went through in your old job that you can't see that God is calling you to your, your business. Stand with me. Father, we love you. We thank you for grace. We thank you for mercy. Lift your hands with me, everybody. Lift your hands. Close your eyes. I thank you for grace. I thank you for mercy. I pray that today, Lord, that these efforts of trying to teach this would have not been in vain. I pray that somebody will hear the mighty warrior in them today as you are speaking to the other them. That today, here's the, here's the goal, that today everybody walks out here saying, I finally got to meet me. What I've been through as a child, what I've been through as an adult, relationships, dramas, difficulty, most of which was my choices. That's not the end. That's not the end of me. I'm now going to live according to my creation, not what happened in my formation that deformed what God originally intended. I need to be reminded. 
Thank you, Father. There's 22 people in this room. 22 people I hear the Lord say. There's 22 people. If you can make it down here, I'd advise you to come quickly. But there's 22 people. Some of you, it's a mixture of people. Some people need to come to God for the first time. It's the first time you've been in a church. I hear the Lord saying there's five of you. It's the first time you've been in a church where you've heard something taught like this in a way that spoke directly to your spirit. He said the best thing you can do is respond by coming down. The pastoral team are going to pray with you at the front. Come quickly. Quickly, those five especially. Come quickly, quickly, because I've got to get the other service in. I guess they're probably lining up, and, I, and this must be done. So come on, don't play with it. Come on, this your life is too important to play with. Wherever you're coming from, come quickly. Just tell the person, to excuse me. I know it might look like a long journey, but come on down. Come on, come on, those five of you. Those five of you. As a man of God, I know when I hear the Lord. Come on, those five of you, five of you. Come on, those of, those of you are coming, come quickly. And then I want the rest of you to follow behind. Come on, bless you, darling. Come on up, come on. If you're coming from the balcony, come on down, wherever you're coming from. And some, some of the rest of that 22, some of you are going to come. You need to come back to God or some of you need to just touch and agree with somebody about the fact it's time for the real you to stand up. You know what you went through as a child. You know what you went through in life. You know how the enemy tried to deform what God originally intended. Come on down here quickly. Grab your bag. Grab whatever you need and come on down here. I'm going to give you another 60 seconds to come on down. Don't resist it. Don't allow pride and don't allow can't be bothered and don't allow it look so far to hold you back. Your life is too important to play with God. Don't walk out of here saying knowing that you played with God. Come on now. Wherever you're coming from, come quickly. I'm going to wait for you real quick, and then I'm going to quickly close the service. If they're coming from the balcony, my team up there, love you guys. Help them down. Help them get down as quickly as possible. If you're online, just email if you'd like somebody to reach out to you and pray with you. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Uh, and those two individuals, Vanessa and Lorraine, I, God gave me your names in the spirit uh, at the beginning of the service. And he said, you need to run back to him. He didn't say you need to come back to him. This is what scared me, concerned me. He didn't say come back to him. He says you need to run back to him because he knows what's in the future. So if that's you, uh, I, that's all I got, Vanessa and Lorraine. And they're two individuals. I don't think you're related. Just two individuals online, my e-tribe. I heard from the Lord about that, I believe, today. I want you to reach out to us because the team will get back to you. For the rest of you, come forward, pastoral care team, begin to pray for these individuals. For the rest of the church, let me pray over you before I dismiss you. Father, take us home safely. Take us home changed. Take us home challenged. Take us home having conversations about what we heard today. And take us home feeling and knowing that there's a mighty warrior in this, on the inside of us. We ask this to be done, Father, in the name of Jesus. Let the church shout amen. amen. Hug your neighbor. Hug him right now. Grab him. Hug him and say, hey, mighty warrior.